how we thank you for the privilege that we have to come and to witness baptism, to witness the, the renewing of life. God, we know the baptism doesn't save us, but we know that it is an outward profession that they love you. They belong to you now. God, I pray that you allow us to be able to be good examples to them, to be able to come alongside them and guide them in their faith. God, I pray that you allow us to be able to go into this community and, and live out our faith. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen. We're so glad you came to worship with us this morning. In Psalms 96, verse 11, it says, Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is within. Let, then, they, then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Stand and worship with us this morning as we sing. Sing with us. Sing to the king who is coming to reign. Sing to the king who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the lamb that was slain. Life and salvation, his empire shall bring. And joy to the nations when Jesus comes. Let us sing. So come. Sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Lift it up and lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. For his returning, we watch and we pray. For his returning, we watch and we pray. We will be ready the dawn of that day. We'll join in singing with all the redeemed. Cause Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King. So come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to sing it again. Oh, come, let us sing. So come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise and sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Amen. Obviously, you guys know that I am not Chris Bozeman. He is out today with a, with a hoarse voice. You wouldn't want him up here singing at you this morning, I promise you. He sounds terrible. So I'll be in prayer for him. But we're going to continue worshiping this morning with our God. This is a song that is talking about the glory of our God. And if he is for us, who could ever stop us? If God is for you, who could be against you? <laughs> Sing with us. Water you turned into wine. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you there's none like you sing it out this morning our God our God is greater our God 
Beloved Initiative, which is an anti-trafficking and sexual abuse awareness campaign. My ministry right now looks like reaching our refugee friends and their families, our homeless friends, and also women who are experiencing exploitation. There are so many parts to the equation. We look for, you know, creative ways to, you know, meet needs. I'm really passionate about gifting essential products, but it's the importance of leaving the pews and going out and being the light and love of Jesus. We have volunteers within our churches. We're creating, you know, earrings and bracelets to then use those for our street outreach. We can um, just bless um, women that are in the strip club or on the street. And the goal is just really that the loss will be reached with the love of Christ. When people give to the Annie Armstrong offering, uh, individuals are receiving Christ and realizing their beloved identities as beloved sons and daughters. Your generous support is going towards so many individuals who do not have a relationship with Jesus, helping them realize that they are loved and loved by Christ. Amen, amen. Part of, and hear me now, because this is, this, this touch is deep for me. I mean, it, it part of any kind of ministry, and if you name the name of Jesus as your Savior, and you have a pulse, you are called to ministry. It may not be vocational ministry, but you are called to ministry. And so any part of ministry is being very deeply aware where do I need Jesus right now what sin of mine is he trying to overturn its stronghold in my life what sin of somebody else's 
that has left a scar is he trying to change and heal and love into a different chapter of wisdom and experience so that he can restore dead men's bones. That's the Savior we interact with. That's what he wants to do. And we've got people who now who, who are going out all across North America, one of the most secularly wounded societies on the planet. They've abandoned God, and they, in their soul, pay the price. It's like osteoporosis of the soul. They can't see it, but it's, they're riveted with it. And you have people who have the responsibility to look deep within so they can guide people to the same places with Jesus that they themselves have been. When we give the Annie Armstrong offering for North American missions, and you can see we're, about, we're almost halfway to our goal. You can see the cross there, and the flowers on the cross represent how far we have to go. So we're almost halfway through the month of April, and we're almost halfway through our goal. But what we're doing is we're taking away one concern, one worry, from people who need to be focused upward so that they can be focused outward and be the bridge between that love and this human that needs it. So when you give, you're facilitating healing. You won't know about this side of heaven. And listen, if we need Jesus, when we all do, we know what that healing feels like. Come to the Lord with your generosity. Father, thank you for the men and women who go out and touch people that maybe wouldn't even darken the door of our church, at least at first. And they touch with so much authenticity and with vulnerability and with honesty and sometimes with tough love and exhortation. They, they go and they go into places that are difficult and they bring the word of God and the love of Christ. And they love them into following that standard. Thank you for them. Bless them, take care of them, and help us do our part to do that. We love you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're our guest here today, we're so glad you are here. We have our little pull-off slip here on our bulletin, or you can click that QR code. That just kind of lets me know you visited today and you want me to give you a call. So if you'll fill that out and drop it in the offering plate a little later in the service or click that QR code, I'll be calling you this week, and we can maybe get to know each other a little better. Let's pray again, and then we'll turn it back over to Adam. Father, bless this Sunday. Bless this worship service. Let it be about you. Let us leave different than we walked in. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 At this time, let's stand and have a meet and greet this morning as we continue in worship. And we're going to sing about standing on the promises of God. If he said it, he will do it. Sing with us this morning. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Stand. promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God standing on the promises I cannot fail when the howling storm of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God Standing, standing, standing 
standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises in the last. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Savior's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises, think standing on the promises. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Remain standing as we continue this morning with our offertory song. Second Corinthians 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror of the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to to glory just as by the spirit of the lord people discredit the power of the holy spirit they don't understand it because they've never had it work in their life this song there's several different kinds of songs we sing some songs are about god some songs are to him like a prayer like you're telling him you want something and when you tell the lord to make you more aware of his presence, don't be surprised when he does. It says, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill, fill it up, the atmosphere. Your glory is what our hearts long for. To be overcome. You ever been overcome by something? You don't know what to do? You're just overcome, overwhelmed. We want to be overcome by your presence. Is that something you really want in your life? It'll change it. It'll change your life if you do. There is nothing worth more that will ever come close. I love this song. The words mean something. So when you sing it, don't let it just be something that comes out and doesn't go through your head first. Mean this from your heart. Sing this to the Lord with us this morning. Sing with us. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope in your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Sing Holy Spirit from your heart And Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the That again, church. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. In your presence, Lord, I've tasted it the sweetest of loves I've tasted and seen 
of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free yet my shame is undone in your presence Lord sing it out Become more aware of you, God. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory. Children can come on down for Children's Church. Come on down, kids. so glad you guys are here this morning. 
So we're going to be moving on from what we've been talking about in Children's Church, and we're going to be talking about psalms this morning. Anybody know what a psalm is? It's kind of strange, huh? Who knows where psalms is in the Bible? This is Rowan's Bible. Rowan brought his Bible to church this morning. Thanks, Rowan. I didn't have mine with me. I left it in the car. If you take the Bible and you open it right to the very middle, I'm not even going to really try to look. You open it right up to the middle by about a couple of pages, you will be in the book of Psalms. It's right in the middle of our Bible. It is the book that the Jews used as their worship book. Sometimes we use this. Back in the, this is a, this is a hymnal. They used the book of Psalms as a hymnal. It was, simply means praises. Psalms mean praises, and they're praising God. So y'all are going to learn some about Psalms and who wrote it and why it was written and some of the language that's used in it and why it kind of sounds like poetry sometimes, like, like what we learn in school. So that's what we're going to learn about today. I want y'all to think about it when y'all are back there. Think about when you're reading through Psalms and you're looking at this stuff, think about it almost like it's a song, like what we just did just now when we were worshiping. All right? Everybody got that? Cool? All right, let's bow our heads and close our eyes and we're going to pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that you are a God that never fails us. We thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. I pray that as we leave this room now and we depart uh, for our kids to go and learn more deeply about you, that you allow them to have ears that listen. Allow them to be able to remove distractions and focus on you for just a few minutes this morning. And we give you all the thanks and the glory and the honor. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, good morning. As you turn to the book of Genesis chapter 37, I got to admit I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Today we begin a look at one of the most beloved accounts in the Word of God. And I try not to use the word story, beloved story in the Word of God, because the world wants to, to believe these are old stories that a bunch of people think you should listen to to tell you how to live. And they are not just stories. They happen. This is history of God interacting with his people. It's an account, one of the most beloved ones. I think it's so beloved because it is so human. Because we all have had people, as we look at the Old Testament story of Joseph for the next few weeks here, we've all had people that we trusted or that we should have been able to trust do us wrong. We've all had people use us. We've all had people take advantage of our good intentions for their sinful purposes. We all have believed the first lie of Satan, and this was powerful to me. I read this in a book about two weeks ago, that one of the first lies of Satan about the nature of God is that God is a tyrant because when Satan's talking to Eve, when the serpent is talking to Eve in the Garden of Eden, he says, God just doesn't want you to eat that fruit because he doesn't want you to be like him. He's trying to hang on to power. And we all know that your upbringing, the way you view your parents, ends up affecting how you view God. Listen, I ran away from home at 17 years old with family's help. I was raised by tyrants. And that hit me right here and right here. And within the last two weeks, that opened up something for me. Deep in my walk with the Lord. Lord, how have I quietly, un, un, unexpectedly, unintentionally viewed you as a tyrant? How have I viewed you as someone who just demands of me rather than someone who wants to fill me up? And he's broken through that many times and filled me up. And, and in spite of my scar tissue there. But how have I made it more difficult than it had to be? How does that affect how I live, how I'm a husband, how I'm a pastor? Who knows? I'm two weeks into thinking about this. But that first lie of the devil, God's just trying to control you. That's what most people believe about us and about God. Or we've all at one point or another, if it's not that, we've felt forgotten. Or we've felt the deep agonizing pain of waiting on God and then waiting on God some more. Often you can't tell me exactly what God is working on you on right now. You have to look in hindsight because he's shaping on a time scale that is his and not ours. 
we know that ultimately if we're in Jesus, if we are truly bought by the blood of the Lamb, if we are truly walking with His Lordship, we will see on this earth His hand move in mighty ways around us. And I have. Ultimately, like a thief in the night, we see the world made right. And His time scale for it all unfolds. I think we're getting closer and closer to it every day. We connect so well to the account of Joseph in the Old Testament because to some degree this account is also our account. It's our story. It's a story for our time. When you think of the family dynamics of Joseph's family, they were all started because of a disregard for God's standard of sexual morality. A disregard for God's design for marriage. The patriarch Jacob, who later got called Israel, he had, count them, two wives and two concubines. And he had kids with every single one of them. And the world of that day said, that is just fine. If you can afford them, you got them. God never says that's okay. The Bible reports that it happened. But it was a sin, and every time it happens, it leads to death and destruction. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Abigail and Melissa and Sally. Biblical marriage is one man and one woman for life. And honestly, if you look at our society, if everybody absolutely lived like the Bible said live in the most intimate part of our lives, our society would be so different different and for the better. It would be the end of STDs. It would be the end of fatherlessness. It would be probably, most of the time, it would be the end of 90% of poverty. That's a sexual sin in most instances. It would be the end of the welfare state. It would be the end of so much black market activity. Go ask any cop you know how much the absence of a father changes the course of the generations sexual immorality and the warping of god's view of sex and marriage always 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 creates deep-seated problems it created problems in the family of the patriarch abraham which is joseph's great-grandfather I'll give you three little examples. Abraham's famous attempt to create an heir. God had promised him one. You're going to have a son. He's going to come from your body. He's going to be heir of everything. I'm going to make mighty nations out of you. In fact, I'm changing your name from Abram, mighty father, to Abraham, mighty father of the nations. It didn't happen on Abraham and Sarah's time frame. So Sarah goes, hey, why not Hagar, the maidservant? Have at it. And they did. And we still, to this day, in the news this weekend, are fighting the battles that have come from that sin. Abraham and Jacob, example number two, both tried to pawn their wives off as their sister for financial gain in foreign kingdoms. And then this one, number three, we look at today. Jacob has 12 children by four women and the drama continues the agony continues who will turn this family around Joseph Joseph will turn this family around and he does it by way of suffering and agony and dying to his own will and letting God be God he does it even though he's Old Testament by the way of the cross and there is no experiencing the joy of walking with God without going through the cross. With each generation of the patriarchs, with Abraham, Joseph's great-grandfather, Isaac, Joseph's grandfather, Jacob, Joseph's father, the family just goes downhill. It gets worse and worse. They repeat mistakes. 400 years later, Moses would be on Mount Sinai, and here in Exodus 20, the sins of the father getting passed down through the generations. Yeah, yeah. He probably nodded his head at that one like, I know. I know. All of these men in this family, when times got tough, they cop out and took the easy, sinful, convenient way out. Not Joseph. 
over and over and over and over in his life. When things go to hell in a handbasket, he remains faithful. He remains obedient to the standards of God. And we're going to steep in that for several weeks. Does that remind you of anybody, by the way? Oh, little Christs, Christians. A righteous man who pays for the mistakes of others, even though it costs him dearly. The whole account of Joseph, I want you to be looking for Jesus, Jesus, Jesus on every single page. Joseph foreshadows Jesus, and it paid off. Not just for Joseph, for you and me as well, 4,000 years later. He saved his family. He saved a lot of other people from famine that was going throughout all the lands around Egypt. And from that very family, Israel, comes Jesus, who is going to save everybody that will have him for eternity. At this time, I'd invite you to stand out of respect for the authority of the Word of God, if you're able. We'll be in Genesis 37, 1 through 4. We're going to read these four verses together. Ready? Let's go. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was Canaan. <clears throat> this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them as to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Father, this just looks like us in the world, if we're doing it right. So help us do it more right when we leave here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Let's just start with Jacob and Rachel and Leah. I tell you, I'm so tempted every time I see Leah to say Leah, like Princess Leah. But I'm pretty sure it's Leah. Jacob and Rachel and Leah. Jacob goes and works. This is, this is the father of Joseph. As a young man, he goes and he works for Laban. He goes and works for uh, Leah and Rachel's father, and he wants to marry Rachel, and, and, and Laban's all on board with that, says, yes, you can marry her, but you've got to work for me seven years, and then you can marry her. And somehow he gets tricked into marrying Leah, and in our modern world we go, what kind of dummy are you? How'd, you? how'd you not figure that out? It has to do with the wedding ceremony for Jews, and Jesus is all over this. The return of Christ is all over this. Right? The way you get married in this day and age, if you're a Jewish young man, is your parents go to her parents, and y'all work out a deal, and y'all agree this is going to work, and then y'all kind of separate. The young man, the fiancé, the groom-to-be, then goes off and prepares a honeymoon suite. Most young men I know would be lucky to get a canvas tent and a cot put up, and he'd be ready to go get the girl. No, 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 no. The dad, the father, is there to say, son, he knows a little better how women think. That's not good enough. We're going to design something beautiful. She's worthy of it. We're going to design something amazing. We want her to be impressed when she walks in the door because she's worth all this work. Listen, our Savior says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I don't know the day or the hour only my father knows he's going to tell me the day or the hour and when the place I prepare for you that is so good that no eye has seen no ear has heard no human mind can even imagine that's how much I love my bride right you're worth it when that's ready then I'll come get my girl the church and, and, and so what happens in Jewish weddings is then, okay, you get all your buddies together and you get the torches and you go in the middle of the night and you walk in the door, quick look to dad, like, hey, it's me, put, put, put the shotgun away. And, and then you run up, you get the girl, you cart her off, the whole community has heard you coming and they all get up and come out in the middle of the night and guess what you do? They start, they start a feast right outside your honeymoon suite, which is a little awkward. And they've packed it with food. For two or three days, and husband and wife go in, and when you come out, the party begins. That's how Jacob got fooled. He walked in to the suite he had prepared, probably, and the candles were not lit, and the wrong girl was waiting. 
got there ahead of time, did something different. They fooled him. He didn't follow God's plan. So he realizes that something's been made a mistake, but he's in it now. And so he goes back to his father-in-law and says, what in the world are you doing to me? I wanted Rachel. Now they start, they keep, this family just keeps twisting and twisting and twisting. He says, all right, work with me for seven more years and I'll give you Rachel too. And that's what happens. And so for 14 years he worked for Rachel. Now the Bible calls Leah, 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 I'm doing it again, the unloved wife. Say unloved wife. The Hebrew is even stronger. She is the detested wife. I didn't want you. And I got manipulated into having you. I'm a marriage counselor. How many people have felt that way? This division in the family starts in the warping of marriage. Needless to say, there was tension in this family. There was hatred in this family. Benjamin and Joseph are the sons of Rachel, the beloved wife. Jacob worked 14 years to have her. I call my wife my favorite wife. She's my senorita favorita. But that was really like there was competition. She's got no competition. There was competition in this family. And Rachel was absolutely the senorita favorita. But just like this family has had problems with in the past, Rachel couldn't have kids at first. So what do they do? They repeat the sins of the family. And they go, well, what about the servants? We can make them concubines. Take the maid servants. Zilpah. Say Zilpah. We're on the next slide, guys. And Bilhah. Bilhah. Very good. You would have thought they would have learned. But they didn't. So here's the 12 tribes of Israel. The sons of Jacob. Six of the sons are from Leah. Issachar, Judah, Reuben, Simeon, Zebulun, and Levi. You would later know these to be the tribes of Israel by the same name because they are the descendants of these men. They're the families of these men. There's the sons of the concubine Bilhah, Dan, and Naphtali. There are the sons of the concubine Zilpah, Gad, and Asher. And then there are the sons of the beloved wife, Rachel. She has Benjamin and she has Joseph. No, she has Joseph and then she has Benjamin. And she dies in childbirth while giving birth to Benjamin. Now, notice something up here. Look at Issachar, Judah, Reuben, Simeon, Zebulun, and Levi. Levi is the priests. Levi is the son of the despised bride. Oh, children of the church, the world hates you because you're the priests. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. Do not be. Even God uses his sin to, to, to point to Jesus, point to Jesus, point to Jesus. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. Like I said, if you, love, if you have Jesus in your heart and you have a pulse, you are a priest in the kingdom. There's no one dividing you from God. You can go directly to him. The priests, Levi, are sons of the detested bride. But the favorite wife, Rachel, the one he worked 14 years for, the one who at first couldn't have kids and then finally did. This had to feel like miracle babies. And she dies giving one last act of love to give Jacob. Benjamin, man, if you don't think there are battle lines drawn in this family now, you must be an only child. My kids can't make it through a long trip without fussing with each other. If the beloved wife dies giving birth to one last prayed for miracle child and if the detested wife so much as breathes wrong around him there's trouble he thinks you've seen some battles in some blended families not like this you haven't seen nothing compared to this and yet don't don't miss this don't miss this because this is a mirror to our soul this gives us hope because this is the family this is the crazy family that God is going to use to bring forth the nation of Israel, to bring forth Israel's Messiah, Jesus, to bring forth the day when that trumpet sounds and the world gets put right and heaven and earth come back together in a way that makes Eden look shabby. Salvation for all who will accept it. This is the family, and we've been all adopted into this family. We've been grafted into the vine that is Israel by the adoption of Jesus Christ. And so... That explains church drama, right? Because wherever you see this family, the nation of Israel, and all of the Old Testament go through competition or 
pride or too much self-reliance or objectification of other people. Boy, Heidi, you see that in the church too. So now the stage is set. There's drama. There's competition. There's argument. I can tell they're Jewish. I got Jewish step family and they, they argue because they're bored. Oh. Or maybe they do something they know they're not supposed to do. Now remember, Joseph is the kid of the good wife, the beloved wife. And you can feel how much he's a little goody two-shoes right here. And just like kids do, they're great at playing divide and conquer. So 17-year-old Joseph runs home and tattletales. And he gives a bad report on Dan and Naphtali and Gad and Asher. Verse 3 says, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Verse 4 says, they all knew it. Let's read those two verses. And Joseph, verse 3 and 4, 2b, actually starting the second half of 2. Joseph bought a, brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Was Joseph right or wrong to do this? Obviously, Dan and Naphtali and Gad and Asher made some kind of mistake. They did something they shouldn't have done. Joseph was probably technically right, but it's possible to go about the right thing in the wrong way and still make things worse. And in Joseph's case, it's possible, particularly among family, to let the old wounds and the old battle scars, like I was talking about, influence how you deal with others. And it really comes out when you're trying to correct somebody else. Have you ever seen somebody who hurt you mess up? <laughs> and you see your opportunity to rub their face in it and hurt them back. And you think it's righteous indignation, but it's not. It's pride. It's unrighteous indignation. And then the Holy Spirit, if you're in the Word of God, the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 bless those that persecute you. Love your enemies. Bear with one another's burdens. Consider others' needs better than your own. Before you call out somebody's sins, beloved, really do a heart search. And make sure that your motives are right. Make sure you deal with the log in your eye so you can, the scripture says, deal effectively with the splinter in somebody else's eye. Even in, I think it's Galatians, it says, look, those of you who are spiritual, when you have to restore a brother who has fallen into sin, watch out for pride because the devil will jump in and get you on pride if he can't get you on anything else but notice it says when you go to correct somebody by all means correct them don't just sit on your hands that's what the world wants us to do the world wants us to never ever 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 no matter what you do call out sin unless it's a sin we think's a problem but we're supposed to call sin sin in the world we're supposed to call sin, sin amongst the family of God. When God loves his children enough to say, kids, don't run with the scissors, it's there for a reason. It's because that sin will hurt you. He says this because he's trying to spare us the devastating, transgenerational, sometimes over the course of nation states, the effects of sin. He doesn't want it to hurt his children. And we have an obligation to warn people and say sin doesn't pay. It's not worth it. You know, even now, when we call sin, sin, even with the right heart, the other children we live on this earth with still don't like it. The other children we live on this earth with still hate us. We have a father who adores us. He sees his favorite boy in us, Jesus. So he warns us, and we get to experiment with that in life. Let's live his way and see if my peace increases. See if Jesus says he's come that I may have life and have it more abundant. Let's test this theory out, and then I can share with somebody else. Not just don't do this, don't do that. But if you'll do it his way, there is joy, there is peace, there is blessing. I've lived long enough to see the blessing, I've seen God make this path straight. The high place is low and the low place is high. I can testify to that. We have an obligation to warn people. But when we warn them, they hate us. 
just like Joseph's brothers hated him, just like the crowd yelled, crucify, when asked, what should I do with Jesus? Verse 4 says it had gotten so bad that the brothers could not even speak peaceably to him. Whatever they did, Joseph had identified their sin as sin, and they hated him for it. And this family would do this for millennia. This family is now known as the nation of Israel, Jacob, Israel. This family would go on to reject Jesus, reject his apostles, just like they, and he told them this, they had rejected prophets for centuries after centuries. It was so common, this rejection of God's word that, and his messengers, that it got brought up in Jesus' first recorded sermon. Let's pull up Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. It says, blessed are you, say this next word with me, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Beloved, that's what we're called to. Joseph is one of these hated prophets, and boy, did he prophesy. In his late 20s and early 30s, he foretold years of plenty. He foretold years of famine. He foretold in a roundabout way the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Remember, and we'll get to this in more detail in a few weeks, who was he in prison with? Pharaoh's baker and Pharaoh's cupbearer. Bread and wine. There's your communion right there. There's Lord's Supper. Guess what happens to the baker? He gets hung on a tree. And the birds eat his flesh like they did with many crucifixion victims. It was before crucifixion even existed. Jesus is all over this account. The family of Israel persecuted Joseph personally. And they came at him with absolutely everything they had. The blitz was on, but Joseph won. Joseph won because no matter the circumstances, no matter the despair or the unfair that he saw himself in, he maintained his commitment to God. He kept his standards and a hunger and thirst for righteousness. So when, when you go out in the world and you call sin, sin, and there is plenty to call sin, when you go out in the world and the other children revile you and I guarantee you they will and if they never do you're being too timid except the fact that this is the normal path that we have chosen when we decide to follow Jesus when they speak against you smile know that you're on the side of the true king no they are not the first or the last to go after somebody who tell tells people God's truth When we go out there, especially in the way we've warped intimacy so hard, we've literally warped the very image of God in people. Hey, world, don't warp something that God made as a holy, intimate gift. Don't warp something that God created as an interactive object lesson of heaven and earth, of Christ and his bride, the church. Don't warp that. It never leads to blessing. It only leads to cursing. The world loses its mind on you. Why that thing in particular? Why that sin in particular? Because it's the last transcendent thing an atheistic world has left to worship. And they do. And it kind of does feel bad when they lose their mind on you. But remember, it's an opportunity. Because when they lose their mind on you, and we'll see this as this account of Joseph unfolds, in that moment, you have the opportunity to love your enemies, you have the opportunity to bless those that persecute you. And maybe, maybe, as they strike you on one cheek and you turn to them the other, they can finally see Christ in you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And that's more or less what happened to Joseph. He ultimately blesses the very people he called out. He blesses the very brothers who sold him into slavery and attacked him. And it all points to Jesus. Does your life point to Jesus like that? What do you do when you're treated unfairly? What do you do in your marriage when you're treated unfairly? What do you do? Is it what Jesus would do? Or is it what the world says to do? If you will
will turn the other cheek. If you will call out sin and let them strike you and love anyway, the world, through your boldness, gets to see Jesus. Will you accept it? Let's pray. Father, allow us to be people who walk into the line of fire, walk into the burning building of the world on purpose, knowing the consequences of it, the temporal consequences of it, and knowing that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Lord, let us take up the cross and follow you. Lord, let us go where you lead. Let us be people who even though we get thrown in the pit by this world, we still grow through that obeying you and let you work out the timing where they see your hand on us and want you. You give your only son to die for that very thing. Let us die to self so that they may see Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here and you've not given your sins to Jesus, he wants to forgive you. He died to forgive you. He rose again to show you it's finished, it's done, it's forgiven. There's new life in him. We just did baptism. My old life is dead. My new life is resurrected up out of the, the, the tomb, out of the water. And I want to learn to live that life better. If you've not started that journey with forgiveness of sins, if you've not buried that old life, come on down right now during the time of invitation and let's pray about that. If you're here and you just need somebody to pray with you, come down. If you're here and you feel God pulling you into this fellowship, this family of faith as we figure it out together, as the Lord leads during our time of invitation, would you come? Adam. Would you stand and sing with us?
I'm going to get Lance and Tara to be working their way up. They're going to talk about the Exo Marriage Conference again, but or just Tara, okay, all right. And um, but also really important, we were talking about in deacons uh, meeting this morning. Had a really great deacons meeting, and uh, this is the deacon nomination season. So if you have someone out there, a man that you think would be uh, a good deacon to serve in the ministry of our church, to serve families and widows, and to help carry the the pastoral presence of ministry in our church. Um, please do turn those in. We've got forms out on this table right out here and the table right through that door all the way to the back of that little foyer or the information table. And you just put their name on there. You put your name on there so we know who nominated them. And you give it to them. And then they pray about it. Some of the qualifications and scriptures and all that are on that form. They pray about that. And then if they choose to accept, they simply turn it back into either me or one of our deacons, and then they take it from there. And there's multiple layers of prayer and process that go into that. Deacons are tone setters in the church, and so it's extremely important. And we want you to be prayerful about this as they minister and as they lead. So please do. We're going to take up these nominations uh, through about May. So uh, be, you, you, we're not in a hurry, but we don't want you to forget. You know what I mean? So be, be in prayer about that. Tara, I'll hand it over to you, dear. And just through me. Good deal. A couple of quick other announcements going on is do not forget, know thy enemy study going on this evening starting at 5 as well as starting at 6, continue with the Ezekiel study. So if you were here last week for that, be sure to come back. And if you missed last week, that's okay. You can come in and pick right back up. Also, do not forget next Sunday we have our uh, quarterly business meeting, so be aware of that as well. Also, next Sunday, 7.30 a.m. is our Brotherhood Breakfast. So... All men are invited. Uh, bring your uh, sons. It's a great time. We always have a good time. Good deal. Also, blood drive. If you are interested in uh, partaking in the blood drive, there is a sign-up sheet at the information table over here in the back, back in this breezeway back here. Sign up. It's going to be April 24th, 4.30 to 7.30. So get signed up. It goes to a uh, good need, everybody, every so often. I like giving blood because... Whenever I give blood, I feel like I'm kind of like rejuvenating myself. I feel like I'm just like starting afresh. I don't know. That's me. Uh, you may not feel that way, but that's how I feel when I do it. Do not forget to be praying about our Annie Armstrong. Also, this past Saturday, we started soccer. We continue on going through with the rest of the month and the first week in May. And so if you're involved in that, uh, we thank you for being involved and helping out. If your child is participating in that or grandchild, we thank you all for helping support our student ministry. And speaking of that, May 5th. May 5th, uh, that's a Sunday. We're going to be, our students are going to be selling a jambalaya plate lunches. It's not a meal to stay back here and eat. It's going to be a, you're going to buy the plate lunch. We're going to give it to you in a go box, and you're going to go home with that. And so they're $10 a plate. As of right now, I have tickets for you to purchase, and so does Miss Tabitha. After Wednesday, our students will have those as well. 
So that's going to be May 5th, $10 a plate, jambalaya plates. It's going to be really good. It'll be jambalaya, green beans, and roll. And it'll be just come and, come and grab you and take it home and go eat it. Uh, also, last thing I want to mention, do not forget, uh, if you have not finished your deposit for Century Kids, your second deposit is due May 1st. Let's be here quicker than you know it and be aware of that. That is all the announcements I have. Shane, uh, your oldest child is nine years old, so uh, if you keep shaving and giving blood, we're going to be looking at Cody like, what are you doing with this 27-year-old, you know? <laughs> no, uh, just picking. All right, if y'all would, please stand. Scott Lowe, would you close us in a word of prayer? Also, no choir practice at 6 p.m. tonight. Chris is sick, so no choir.